Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is actually Dan Nault. And uh, the, uh, it's great to have the session right after lunch, because I'm going to make sure we're all fully engaged, because I guess it said there's no such thing as an X database person. And I've been an X database person for a while, I guess, or still a database person, as the case may be. Uh, I work in headquarters for Raju Gulabani, who's the head of all database analytics and ML. And uh, I also run the database migration service schema conversion tool and our database freedom effort to help customers migrate onto our platform. Today I'm going to talk about the portfolio from a scale perspective. So let's talk about scale for a couple of minutes. So the scale we are seeing is absolutely unprecedented. And decades ago when I was working on the YF-22, now the Raptor, we thought scale was probably a VAX 8840. And now look at what we have. It's just simply amazing. So in looking at the scale, it doesn't look the way it used to. Big scale used to mean you know, a single big scale up machine or maybe a really big relational database. Well, these days, some traditional apps like ERP, CRM, and e-commerce, they mostly use relational databases, and they probably still will for a lot of them if they require transactions and then storing structured data. Let's come back to that. But the app requirements are significantly changing. And a one-size-all-fits approach isn't how we build things these days. An incremental number of databases are using relational and non-relational. And databases that are purpose-built for the need is the way to think about these. Some relational, some non-relational, some in memory, some graph. So we build all of these. So if you're building an online purchase site, you might say, hey, I'm going to go use a relational database to help have all the financial transactions right. And that might make sense to do to make sure the orders are 100% correct. But what if you're at massive scale? So if you have a site that you want single digit millisecond latencies at a huge scale, let's just say like Amazon Prime Day, you probably wouldn't use a relational database, right? You'd use a non-relational database, and, and that's what we do. We use DynamoDB, a NoSQL database. Or let's just say you want to have personalized recommendations or correlations across many different dimensions. You probably would use a graph database like Neptune that we've rolled out recently. Or if it's in memory, you might use Elasticache. And it's the characteristics of cloud apps that are driving people using very different database services for very different purposes. Developers are always looking for the right tool for the job with the flexibility to cover this scale. And I will talk, talk about all of these databases for all these scales. Before diving into that, though, I want to call out that this unprecedented scale, like we've never seen before, drives automated management. It simply wouldn't be possible without that. We, we use numbers that are traditionally reserved for astronomy when we build these massive scales. So you take a look at all those things that we used to do in the old world, like 10 years ago, that really you wouldn't do. That would all be managed right now by a cloud service like AWS, so that you can really focus on the business and the, the mission of the business. And uh, you know, our customers use a lot of different managed solutions in database and analytics, all of which I'll cover now. So th this is a slide I could spend hours on, but I'm going to spend just a few minutes to ground us. And it's a traditional stack slide. You can look at it that way. So all the way over on the left, you can see relational databases. The RDS, Relational Data Service, I'll talk about that. And then Aurora, which is a cloud-native database fully exploiting the AWS cloud as a foundation, very high innovation. And then in good Amazon form, a lot of choice of the relational data service covering many different engines. And then moving to the right, you'll see the non-relational databases. I already told you that we run things like Prime Day on DynamoDB for the massive scale that we need there. And then Elasticash, both for Redis and Memcache. And then Neptune, the latest edition, which is for graph database, which is a very relevant for a lot of use cases, very exciting service. So th that covers the database side. Moving over to the right, you can see on the analytics side, Data Warehouse, our Data Warehouse offering is Redshift. I'll talk about that in Redshift Spectrum. For big data processing, there's EMR that does a lot more than just map, you know, map reduce, And then Athena, which will go directly against any S3 storage. So that's kind of at the analytics layer for, I'm going to say, massive scale. And then for real time, we have our managed Elasticsearch service. And then we also have Kinesis data analytics with a number of different pieces there that I'll just cover so that you have that. So you can think of that kind of as the middle layer. What's it on top of? Well, data lakes are in a world of cloud growing in capacity. And you need to get the data in. You can see over there for Glue, you bring it in through ETL, and then you have a data catalog. 
And then over on the left, you've got S3, Glacier, and a whole bunch of different storage ways so that there really isn't any good reason not to get all that data into the cloud with some level of tiering based upon the access you need to have access to all of that. So there's basically the pile of data. And then the database migration, I mentioned the migration service. I ran that service. You can think of that as a way to get all of the data into the cloud and also a way to move the data around in the cloud. And then up at the top in BI and ML, the world is changing very quickly. And it's a very exciting way that it's changing. So we have QuickSight to do reporting and analytics. It's a very fast engine. You can think of it as kind of a UI into the AWS cloud. And then we get into the world of ML with SageMaker that is a way to go build these trained models in a very automated way, make it more addressable for basically all of us to be able to do the things that traditionally only deep uh, scientists in, in the realm of machine learning and deep insight would work there, and then Comprehend for national language processing. Uh, I'll talk about those, but in the context of all this data that they act against, because the world in a world where more and more of the things that we used to do manually are now automatic, so we can move up the stack to the middle. As this is automatic, we can put more and more focus on what do you do with the machine learning? Because one of the great things about having everything in the cloud, in, in an architecture, we have all these different services that work together, is that you can easily tap in and use machine learning within that cloud, because it's all in an architecture that's easily accessed with all the different machine learning. So this is about its scale, so I'll keep it at scale, but I will wrap with just some observations about machine learning. So when we talk about the many families of databases we have, we start with RDS, the Relational Data Service, that has the attributes you can see at the bottom. Managed and automated, high performance and scalable, availability and durability with very simple multi-AZ capability. It's just amazing how easy it is. You click a button and then you have high availability with replication and then data encryption at rest and in transit. So that's true for anything that's in RDS. It automates the patching, backup, high availability, encryption, security, it handles all of those things for you. And with 16 terabytes per any of the instance, you can run hundreds or thousands with very little staff commitment. The scale at which we run is astonishing. And it's almost all hands-free. It's just all very high automation. And then at the top, you can see the family of database engines. And you know, I'll parse it into three. So it's the open source ones. So take that momentum, bring it in, manage, create value for scale. And then over on the right, what we talk about is the commercial databases, the Oracle and the SQL Server. So these are all RDS4 Oracle, RDS4 SQL Server. So you can go run it in a managed way. And then you have Amazon Aurora. And Amazon Aurora is different. And the way to think about how Amazon Aurora is different is just imagine we've built this AWS infrastructure with all these multiple availability zones and regions. And they go run RDS against a database that was never designed to take advantage of that amazing massive scale out. And then you say, wow, we can control all of that. It's all open source. What would it look like if we were to basically rebuild all of the storage and all of the high availability and all of the networking using the, the fundamentals of the AWS cloud? And that's cloud. And that's basically what we did. And I'll talk about that in some detail. Uh, on compliance, our commitment to compliance, you know, in a way it speaks loudly to what you're asking us to go do. Uh, you see we do it across the portfolio for database. And to support the audit and compliance requirements, we make sure that you can run your workloads in RDS. We have a range of compliance. You can see them here, SOC 123, FedRAMP, PCI, DSS, HIPAA, all of that. And the way to think about that is you can go build your apps in the way that's compliant, and then you can go to the compliance bodies and say, hey, it's running on RDS, and that you can take the audit findings you've done and then combine them with the attestations from the third parties that have done all this work for us to have a complete verification of your compliance running on AWS. In other words, we take responsibilities for RDS and the service all the way down. We document it all the ways. And then you take the responsibility for your app running on AWS. And we're very committed to it. And you can see it's become a process for us to have this kind of coverage. Um, across that portfolio. So now let's talk a little bit more about Aurora. Because uh, in a way, the highest innovation way to get your relational data into AWS is, is on Aurora in a compliant way. And, and I mentioned the architecture being such that we basically took the whole storage, shared storage volume, and we pushed it all down to the cloud. And then basically took the technology up above so that it would be very easy for you to migrate over to it. 
And it's MySQL and Postgres compatible with this unique scale-out architecture. It's a distributed, fault-tolerant, high-availability architecture like nothing else is like that. And it has all the security of AWS and the availability and reliability of commercial databases, but at a tenth the cost because of the price point. We don't, we don't charge you for the IP running it, we just charge you for running it. It's open source on the top, it's our storage back end underneath. And um, it scales out, it can have you know, 15 low latency read replicas, it has three availability zones, two copies per six copies, which is pretty amazing capability. And it's all kind of automatic. So if a read replica fails, we reroute to another replica in less than a second. So you have you know, very minimal impact on that. And there's no interruption to the user. And we launched the first one was MySQL. MySQL was pretty far along. We've had a lot of people on it. It's our fastest growing service ever. But you gave us all some very clear feedback. Hey, we want to have that with Postgres. Because the Postgres interface is a natural systematic and semantic join to, to look at some of the other enterprise databases you might have been using. So for example, if you wanted to move an Oracle database over to Postgres, it's, it's easier to go do that. So we added in the Postgres. And uh, with that capability, you have all of the, the high capabilities here. You've got the low cost, the compatibility, the six different copies, the fast failover, and then you can scale up and down. You can scale up to move all the data over and then down the right size to the fit you want. And then we constantly, continuously back it up so that if there's ever an issue, you can transparently fail over recover, typically less than 30 seconds. It's, I can't overemphasize how simple it is to use. It's really um, game changing in the database industry how, how it works in those ways. Now, that, think of that as pretty big scale. This is about big scale. But even when we do these big scale things, there's these little things that we're not sure how big a scale they're gonna be. And for that, we created a serverless version. And what serverless basically means is you don't have to think about the servers at all. Things happen automatically. So if you have an app that's running against a database that you're just not sure how often it's gonna be at full scale because it, it has big usage spikes, or maybe it's dev test and sometimes it's big and usually it's small. And you can do that along with the, the big instances you bought we have an on-demand self-scaling mode for Aurora, and it automatically starts up, shuts down, scales up and down based on the app needs. You don't have to provision, you don't have to manage, it handles all of that, and you only pay per second with one minute minimum for the capacity you use, which is, is really significant savings. So think of it as a portfolio, if you will, of the on-demand serverless, and then the full large instances that you buy and, and, and you consume at it, it, scale. Now, um, the uh, Aurora is amazing, and there's other leading edge technology to get even more scale out. And we announced at reInvent that we're adding these on. They're coming out this year. Let's talk about what they are. So first of all, let's talk about Multimaster. It'll have multiple read-write master instances across multiple availability zones so that you can have a complete failure on an availability zone, and any of these masters can fail with no app downtime, right, for that level of high availability. And it'll take over in under 100 milliseconds. How can we do that? It's just wired deeply into the AWS cloud. There's no layers in between. It deeply uses the infrastructure of it. And we are the first database to scale out both reads and writes across multiple data centers. We are the first one, because the way we built our architecture all the way up for EC2, we're the ones to do that. We are also the first MySQL and Postgres compatible database with this multi-master. Because we have a different target, right? We're trying to bring people away from the high price databases and say, hey, go run on this. So we've brought a very high level of innovation to a one-tenth of the cost that you're used to price point. And then you know, some of us might say, yeah, well, there's one thing that this isn't. And we did take that step. We're going one step further for the multi-region, multi-master. In those cases where you want to have it on multiple regions, just in case you have an event that has an isolation or a degradation of an entire region, 
you'd use the Aurora multi-region multi-master. And that'll enable the apps to stay highly available under any circumstances by replicating data between regions, resolving the update conflicts. So you really can move up the stack, right? Because it's got the scale out handled in a very automatic AWS way. So you can see the level of innovation that we're able to take by fully exploiting the infrastructure fundamentals of, of AWS uh, in, in what we were able to do with Aurora, first MySQL and then Postgres. So just as an example of databases at scale, we'll just talk about the government in Canada. Uh, and the government of Ontario has 14 million people. It's the largest province. They chose AWS. And, and you can see what Zeyn Abdullah had to say, that uh, disaster recovery and auto scaling without purchasing an expensive infrastructure. And there's more that she said here that I'll just mention. They didn't have a big budget. They were constrained. That led them to AWS. And they were able to experiment. And they liked the experiment. And they didn't have to spend a lot of money on an expensive IT system. Because you know, just like scale out has changed a lot, the economics of IT and the economics of the database have changed a lot. And on that theme, uh, you've probably heard from AWS that, uh, that we look at the old world commercial ways and say um, that we can do better. And, and in a sense, the database world has not been a pleasant place for most customers, maybe not for any customers. And because of these practices, basically as much margin as possible, trying to keep people locked in with proprietary code, licensing that makes it really hard to choose where in contrast, we try to make it easy to get on and get off and have a lot of flexibility. And then, uh, and then an audit that would show up funny when you're thinking about, well, maybe I'm not happy about some of that. And, and we think we can do a lot better than that. And we have a lot of customers trying to move as fast as they can to open source databases. And getting the same performance out of an open source database as a commercial grade database is, is difficult. And, and that's, that's why enterprises are coming to us saying they're moving as fast as they can and their prime target for relational database is Aurora for all of the reasons that I just outlined. Now, but, but if you're in a world where you've got a, an old world commercial database, you'd say, well, some of that's OLTP. Some of it, maybe you've been done relational, it should go non-relational, like with DynamoDB. Some of it's a data warehouse. You're gonna wanna go to Redshift. Some of it, probably should have gone to EMR all along. So you can either say, hey, I'm just gonna take this relational thing and just put it to relational, or you can say, hey, no, decades have passed since I architected this thing. I wanna, re I re I wanna rethink what I'm gonna go do there. And we are committed to helping you with both of those paths. And uh, as part of that, kind of iconic that we have Lady Liberty there, isn't it? Um, we have this database migration service that we sometimes talk about as helping you with DB freedom. And this is a service that allows you to migrate from on-premises into AWS, around on AWS, or even off of AWS if for any reason you wanna do that. So we're, 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 we're happy to, to earn it every day. And you can migrate between databases, you can consolidate databases, you can have it be homogeneous. Basically, you can say, hey, I'm gonna move from Oracle to RDS for Oracle, or you can have it go from SQL Server onto Aurora, whatever you'd like to go do. And we highly automate the schema. So what does that mean? We're taking the way of moving from, for example, uh, the schema you'd have with Oracle to bring it over to Postgres. And about a year ago, it was about 60%, and now it's about 90%. And you can see that same level of automation coming over from SQL Server, that same level of automation if you're going to MySQL target. High automation, simplicity, doing with the computer, doing with the machine so that you guys could all benefit from having those kind of tools. And the replication back and forth for this is designed to have very minimal downtime, essentially nearly zero downtime. So the way to think about this is along with the portfolio of great purpose-built DB services, we make it easy to get to the cloud securely and do it in a way that uh, has massive scale with features designed so that you can take a look at some applications, profile the difficulty, take a look at a family of applications in a data center and say, I wanna profile how hard it is so that I can go plan across all of them. And then move them to whatever the open source or commercial databases you want to, to do. 
Now, for very large installations, we have Snowball. So you can take the Snowball, I think you've probably seen it, it's a small thing here, bring it in, hook it up, download onto it, and migrate from that. So we are set up to work with Snowball Edge in, in these migrations on and off. Customers do that. And for perspective, we have tens of thousands of enterprises and startups on Aurora, including you know, big companies, like companies like FINRA, Dow Jones, and Verizon, making the decision to use these kind of technologies to migrate over. So, uh, so things have come a long way. And you can see the curve down below, and you can see that it's accelerating a little bit on how many, how many databases are being migrated over time. Service launched in 2016, and we're at 75,000 databases migrated over. So uh, demand is just increasing. The pace is just increasing. It's kind of fun to, fun to watch it. It's like, a, it's like it's having a portfolio that only goes up and to the right. So a little bit about DMS and, and SCT on that. Now, now I've mentioned DynamoDB. For really critical systems that have massive scale, when you're looking at your relational database that you have now, or looking at what you do, we might do now, I just encourage you to, to think really hard about what scale you need and have, and think about NoSQL, think about it as key value, think about a graph database, think about the best way to go approach this. Now, DynamoDB, think of it as a, as a flagship next generation way to think about databases. It's fully managed, NoSQL, so you don't have to worry about managing the infrastructure. Uh, and generally, NoSQL is designed for scale with a really super sophisticated architecture for massive scale. And, and that generally makes NoSQL hard to operate, significantly hard to operate. We handle all that complexity. And when I say we handle all that complexity, AWS handles all that complexity, so anything even at the most leading edge complexity of Amazon is able to run on DynamoDB. And the developer just has to learn a simple API, and they can use lots of different languages. Uh, and we run at such high scale that it's cost effective. You only use for the storage you're consuming. You only pay for the I.O. throughput, and as the users grow, the I.O. grows, you can very easily add capacity on the fly. If you have a, just a blowout type of demand for whatever reason, you know, it could be something in simulation and technology, it could be something transaction, it could be something interaction that can grow. Um, and it can support millions of users concurrently. We, we do that regularly, and every year we hit a new high with what we're doing. And it's super secure. It's right, super secure for what we have to have it for, what leading edge customers have to have it for. So it has end-to-end -end decryption, fine-grained access control. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think that we will see more and more things that currently are relational moving to non-relational. It's, it's logical when you really kind of click into the details of it. Now, one of the things that's built into DynamoDB, given how mission critical I've just described it as being, is global tables. And Having global tables built on DynamoDB's footprint lets you have this fully managed system that's multi-region, multi-master, just the way we're talking about Aurora, but that way you have super fast local read and write, but for this massively scaled global infrastructure with global, and, and this capability, we're, we're running on it right now with the company, and they replicate the tables automatically to whatever regions you choose. You choose where you want to have it for whatever reasons, availability, geopolitics, and then eliminates any of the work of replicating between the regions, resolving the update conflicts, and it does it so that it's high availability. So you know, just like with the multi-region, multi-master, if you were to lose an entire region, the system keeps running. So we have that for relational, and we have that for non-relational for those database engines that, that we're able to control and, and, and write all the code on. And then sometimes milliseconds aren't fast enough. See the race in the background. So sometimes you want microsecond latency. And that's for some real-time data-intensive applications when you absolutely need to have that kind of speed. For that, we have a different service, the ElastiCache. So a very common solution for this is in-memory. In-memory is excellent. You can read and write f tremendously fast just in microseconds. For example, like that might be a website, a huge website that lots of things are hitting super quickly. And you'd go with in-memory. And you know, it can be the user authentication tokens can go there. A lot of different things can go back and forth there where you want to have it, and you want to have it expire super quickly. So th there's a couple of, of big industry players in that. So there's Redis and Memcache. And, and we support Redis and Memcache, and, th and they're different. 
They're both open source choices. Redis has built-in data structures, sorted sets, lists, geospatial data. Frankly, it's a bigger one in terms of scale. Memcache is a great, easy to use caching system. They, they don't have enterprise features. They don't have the kind of availability we've talked about, the management, the reliability, the scalability. So we basically host both of them in a sense. You can think of it, we have them in self-scaling managed services. The hardware is provisioned, the updates, the backup, the monitoring, all of that we do. And we also do the security, right? The encryption at rest, and then the in transit, in the case of Elasticash, for Redis. Redis is the one that is able to accommodate that sort of thing, helping you secure your data. And you know, each of these businesses I'm talking about are big businesses based upon them being proven by your demand. We build these things because you say, hey, we have this need. What you've built is good, but there's other things we want. And that kind of tees up the next dialogue. So let's talk about Graph a little bit. Graph has been around for a while, but I think Graph is going to hockey stick. So why is Graph going to hockey stick? First of all, let's talk about when you would use Graph. If you have an app that's anything that you refer to as a recommendation or an indication of what you should go do, and it's to have some kind of an organization, an entity, a site of a certain type, like a particular city that some of our connections happen to like. You know, my, my wife went to high school in this area. We visited for a couple of weeks. We got to go to all our schools, try to find the different restaurants, try to do all that sort of thing. There were all sorts of things to figure out what we did, and Yelp was okay. But there's probably a lot more that can be done. But there's a lot of different connected data sets. You need to know the users, their connections, their likes, organizations, entities, attributes, whether it's schools, museums, place to eat, whatever it is. All of that data is in there. And you can, you can go put it in a relational model, but that's a lot of tables, a lot of foreign keys. And it's probably not going to be very fast. And it's probably going to be pretty hard to keep together. And, and, and that's kind of what we heard. So what have people been doing? Well, open source graph databases. But they're not really, they don't scale quite there. They're not mission critical. They don't have these capabilities for HA. So there's been some commercial graph databases that are out there. And um, they're, they're, they're expensive. They're expensive and they're often pretty closed. And they typically have pretty narrow support for which graph models that they would use. That's kind of the reality right now. So what do we want? I think what we want is a graph database that's compatible with you know, all of the leading graph models and has open APIs to move in and out of fast, reliable, scalable, cost-effective. That, that is, that is uh, certainly what we heard. And as a result, we built Neptune. So it's fast, reliable, fully managed graph database. It's easy to build apps that work with highly connected data with a purpose-built graph engine that's optimized for billions of relationships, querying the graph with milliseconds of latency, super massive scale, and it works with the popular models. It works with Property Graph and W3C's RDF, and then they have query languages of their own, Apache, Tinkerpop, Gremlin, and Spark. And it's fully managed with all of these things that we've been talking about with these database services that we have. So, you know, it's got high availability, read replicas, point in time recovery, continuous backup to S3, replication across availability zones. And as you can imagine, we're able to reuse some of our infrastructure for some of these massive scale databases. And secure, it has support for encryption, at rest and in transit. And we launched this fairly recently. It's generally available. And it's, it's just people are picking it up and loving it. It's fun, it's fun to watch that. Um, all indications were that there was demand for graph, and there is demand for graph, so that's good. Now. So that covers the relational and then the non-relational databases. So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about data lakes. Because the world of data lakes has changed a lot in cloud. Think of the massive amounts of data that we say, hey, bring it all into S3. We'll keep driving the price down. We'll try to curve fit it for our costs so that you have it available. But you know, generally speaking, what do customers need? A scalable, secure, super broad platform to put the data storage in for an analytics platform. That's a way to think about the lake, and you can see Lake Michigan in the background. To securely secure all the data from apps and all the devices, whatever format they come in. And it's not allowed to be picky about the formats. With high availability, durability, you know, at any scale. 
and customers need to be able to analyze the data, analyze it in a lot of different ways with a lot of tools and frameworks of their choice. The theme is choice. Get it in here and then look at it with lots of different services, lots of different technologies, so that there isn't friction in you trying it. And the key here is to do it in a low cost way, with low friction, with large amount of data, so that you can get it up into any of these services that I've talked about or any other service that you want to use for that matter that runs on AWS. Why? Why bother to bring all of this data in all of a sudden? Right, because this has been around for a little while. Well, you can, so you can take the dark data and get insights out of the dark data. But we all want to move from beyond you know, insights from operational reporting of historical data. That's really good. But what we really want is, is the ML from that data, right? We want to use it to be able to train models, and with those trained models, predict what could happen, take a look at what is happening to use all that data, to fully get that data from ML. Because just like cloud came and hit IT by storm and made it better for all of us that have been career IT people, ML is going to fast forward us to a totally different place quickly. So all this automation, all this scale, will feed into that. We will add it into all of our different apps. So we're going to expect data lakes are going to be used to go help people have different outcomes. So we have a, a broad way of getting data into the data lakes, and I will, I'll hit on each one of these services. They're all designed to accommodate and have their part. Generally, though, we have a very comprehensive, secure, across all these services, scalable and cost-effective portfolio of services to work to bring data into your data lake and to work from your data lake. And they allow you to build these cloud data lakes that are of an entirely different scale than in the past to analyze the data with the broadest set of capabilities. The traditional capabilities for reporting and analytics, the historical look, and also the, well, what's the pattern hidden in this that we've never, ever seen before that really makes a difference? And, and right now, as a result of the breadth of our platform and the, the way to get at this with services, there's more, there's more teams running their data, data lakes and their analytics and data lakes in AWS than, than anywhere else. There's just a massive amount of data in there, which is an amazing foundation for ML. And, and the kind of customers that do this are customers that are familiar to, 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 to most of us, and some, whether it's Netflix, Zillow, NASDAQ, iRobot, FINRA, yep. All these companies are using our data lake technology to inform what they're doing and bring it together. So some of these services I've talked about, things like Graph, are these companies coming to us and saying, we need a Graph capability and when we tell them we're building one, they're excited about it. Now, um, as part of getting all of that data into that lake, there's, a, there's some mechanics of it all. And we have a service, Glue, which is another fast ramping service, which is an ETL service, so extract, transform, and load service. And it's all backed by a data catalog. Because when you're, you're talking about all this massive data coming in, you need a catalog to basically keep control of everything, to know what's going on. And Glue is designed to be super simple. And um, it's, it's a roadmap to watch because we're going to be constantly investing in it. I think at every reInvent, you're going to see more and more about Glue. But it, it's so simple that you point Glue at the data source and the target. Then it creates the scripts, the scripts to transform, flatten, and enrich the data. It creates the scripts for you in Python. And it's in Python to work in a Sp Apache Spark 2.1 environment. And what it does, though, is it lets you edit the ETL. It provides it for you. then. You can edit it. And then it gives you the endpoints to work on the code, to basically to test the code, debug it, with whatever environment or IDE you want to use. Again, it's a very open way to approach to doing these things to get it all in. Because a lot of things are going to be coming into these, these data lakes. You know, some data is very old. And once you get it all set up, you can schedule the recurring jobs. You can bring jobs together and chain them. You can have them on demand. You can use Lambda with it. It's designed that once you get your data lake all queued up and you have Glue working at, you can run it as a system real time so that it's current, including as you're doing analytics or any ML against it. And it manages the dependencies and the sequencing between the jobs. Uh, and it, uh, it scales um, all the different pieces that way. Uh, and it relates, it restarts jobs if they fail. It manages all these different things, all these different things for you. So what's one of the first things people think about when they have a data lake? OK, I got all the data. I brought the data lake in. I'm probably going to need a data warehouse for some of the really fast repeating. I know I'm going to be going and getting at these different things. 
And uh, Redshift is our fast, fully managed data warehouse. It's simple, very cost effective to bring it through using standard SQL and all of your existing business intelligence tools. Purpose built for the scale of the cloud. Again, at that tenth of the cost of what people are used to doing. And you can run very complex analytic queries against petabytes of structured data here. And it's columnar, you'd expect that probably. And it uses high performance local disks and then massive parallel query execution. Most results come back in, in seconds, very short. And it's also designed to scale all the way down so that people can experiment, as, as we heard from Ontario government. Uh, or you can go to the very large systems, but have a petabyte of data for you know, $1,000 a terabyte. Less than a tenth the cost of the traditional systems is the price point for this. And uh, again, a very fast growing service that people are using against it. And customers said that they wanted even more scale than that. They said, hey, that's great, but I wanna be able to run against exabytes of data that I've got in S3. And it's not practical or cost effective to go pull of that into a high performance disk data warehouse when you wanna query it and then take a look at it and you can take a little bit of latency. So what Redshift Spectrum does is it takes the data and looks at local disks and it also takes a look at what's in S3. So you can query these vast amounts of data that you have in S3 without having to load or transform any data. It goes directly against it. And it uses very sophisticated queries to do that across thousands of nodes. So even with very large queries, it comes back very quickly. And it uses open data formats uh, CSV, Grok, Orc, Parquet, you get the idea. Very broad list of those. Using the same SQL uh, syntax as Redshift. So you can use your same BI tools against it. So it's an incremental thing to add on to. And this ability to span between what you have in Redshift and then S3 and make the decisions is very powerful, including because you only pay for the queries that you run. You don't pre-buy it. You have S3 rates for data storage and then Redshift instances if you're running against Redshift. So you can think of it as an umbrella that reaches across with the same logic in SQL to go against S3 and go against what you would have in, in Redshift. Now I also mentioned EMR for big data processing. And it's a traditional way that people go build a data lake and they go and take a look at it with, with the dupe. And, and EMR provides a, a managed to dupe framework, but framework's an operative word here because it does an awful lot more. So it's, it's very fast, easy, cost effective to, to move across a lot of different EC2 instances to get, to get data. And, and you can also use Spark, Apache Spark, HBase, Presto, Flank. You can use a lot of those different things with EMR. It's a framework that you can go operate a lot of those. And it's very easy to keep it up to date with the latest open source things. So you get the managed, the value of managed. And it works in concert with S3, with DynamoDB as a family on the lake. And it handles all of these big data use cases securely, reliably, and use cases are log, log, analy log analytics, web indexing, data transformation, financial analysis, simulations, and a ton of ML are being done this way. And, uh, and it's very flexible with how we do it. And all of the way we're just doing, driving down the price of having the data in S3, you benefit from that from EMR. So you kind of think of that as storage and, and EMR together as part of your data lake, as a cost-effective way to, uh, to basically go at, go at that data. Now, there's another piece to this, and that's Athena. This is another service that we created to say, hey, you, know, you can go against the data warehouse, you can go against the data warehouse and then other data, but there's another way that people are gonna to wanna to do it, with just a very interactive, lightweight, query, serverless way to analyze data using standard SQL. And with Athena, there's no infrastructure to manage. You only pay for the queries that you run. You point your data at S3, define the schema, start querying using standard SQL, and most results will come within seconds. And uh, anyone with SQL skills, skills can go use Athena. It works with the, the, the glue data catalog that I mentioned. So you have this meta metadata repository of all the data that came in from various services into your lake and they can crawl the data sources to populate the catalog with new tables and new partitions to maintain schema versioning. Now I've just talked about a whole bunch of different analytic services that all work together in the lake. So just think of it, once you start using that data in the lake, you have all those different services. 
And I also mentioned kinesis. And kinesis is a number of different services rolled into one. You can think of it that way. For the real-time streaming data, you see the stream of people, we've added video streams for video, audio, and any other kind of time-encoded data uh, to build apps of any kinds. And I, I, have a, I have a simulation background, but this works for a lot of different things that I can easily envision bringing the data in. So robots, smart cities, manufacturing, security, you get the idea, and it gets used an awful lot for machine learning. It just brings a tremendous amount of data streamed in to go work with. And then Kinesis data streams let you build real-time apps with those streams, not using the, the, the video type of data. Firehose has you bring in a lot of different data into the data stores. And then analytics has you analyze and process real-time with SQL. So you can do some analysis as you bring it in, then you bring it into the data lake, then use all the services that we've talked about. All these services are designed to work together. You can easily assemble these different services, try them, and use them. And for those of you that are working with AWS, that's, that is our design point, to be responsive. You know, um, 80 to 90% of everything we build is based directly on customer feedback, and that's what's reflected in all of these different services. So one other service to talk about that goes against the data lake is Elasticsearch service. And many of you are probably familiar with Elasticsearch. And we also had feedback that, hey, Elasticsearch is great, but it's not managed the way we look to have things managed. So we make it easy to deploy, secure, operate, and scale Elasticsearch. Uh, a lot of demand for log analytics, uh, monitoring, full text search, and things like that. It uses the Elasticsearch e APIs, and it uses the real-time analytics capabilities, but it has all of the availability, scalability, security that production workloads require built-in integrations with Kibana and Logstash, and then totally integrated with AWS, so you can go from raw data to insights. It integrates with our VPC, with Kinesis Firehose I just talked about, with Lambda, and with CloudWatch. And one of the things that's nice is you continue to get direct access to the APIs that are in Elasticsearch, so that you can just easily work back and forth with that community, reducing friction to start using that. Uh, so that's a number of different things that all fit together into the lake. So uh, just as an example of an Elasticsearch use case, the UK government had a lot of web archives, 120 terabytes, and a, a large number of relatively small files, with a lot of bad data uh, in a format that is, and I'm going to say, uh, you know, a, a non-leading edge format. They were able to put everything in S3 storage, bring it over uh, through EC2 with filtering extraction, and then put it into into our uh, Elasticsearch. And they started with a really big cl cluster, which is typical, and then they scaled down once they had all the data over there to reduce cost. And the cost effectiveness is, uh, I'm gonna say, differentiated. And the speed using Hadoop is just super fast. Relative to Hadoop is just super fast. So uh, 146 million documents per hour is indexed. So designed to go work very purpose-built for, for specific uses. So there's one other app that I taught, wanted to, service that I want to talk about. It was up at the top of the stack in the far left when I opened up with the portfolio slide, and that's QuickSight. We use QuickSight to run our business. It's a fast, cloud-powered business analytics service. Think of it as the window into the data in AWS. You can very quickly build visualizations, do analyses, get business insights, connect your data, very easily at massive scale with an engine that drives high performance to do these visualizations and rich dashboards that you can get at from any browser or mobile device. There isn't a compatibility issue. It's there and it just comes up as an AWS service. And it can, it can enable self-service decentralized analytics. It's a very common thing to just set it up and let people ask get the data. And connecting to a data site is super simple. It, you basically, it auto discovers the tables and then shows the data in the table. It's completely serverless, so it's easy to go stand up. There's nothing installed or deployed for QuickSight. There's like another complicated thing to go configure. You just go in and get the data. And um, people often will use it with, with S3 and then Athena to have an end-to-end -end analytic solution with no servers. It's completely serverless to have the S3 data, the uh, Athena, and then work with QuickSight. And we use QuickSight against all of the different services. So I think of it as kind of a wrap on things like that. Now, I want to cap things off a little bit by talking about machine learning. And just sharing a little bit of context that 
is, uh, it's interesting to know. So uh, Amazon has been making huge investments in ML really since the beginning. And back to 1995, you can think about it. And many of the capabilities that we all enjoy from Amazon have ML behind them. But the experience is driven by that. Our recommendations engine is driven by ML. The robotic picking systems, ML, supply chain, forecasting, capacity planning, they're all informed by ML algorithms. Uh, Primair, our drone initiative, has got ML behind it. Amazon Go, which is our retail experience using computer vision, it's all driven by ML. In fact, for a long time, Amazon businesses have had to have how they're going to use computer automation as part of their business plans. But it just isn't something we necessarily talked about very much. But it's a huge part of our heritage. So what's our strategy with ML? Our strategy with ML is to take the same play that we did with AWS for the broadest possible adoption, and in this case, working with all the services that I've described. We set it up so that it's trivial to go use ML and add on experiential services like Lex, the heart of Alexa, or recognition, or some of our natural language processing, along with all of the services that I just talked about for to make it just pervasive, ubiquitous, easy to use. And more customers are choosing AWS as the place for ML than anywhere else. And they're doing it alongside our database and analytics services at scale. So, you know, you might ask yourself, so why did ML just suddenly explode all of a sudden? Some of the things haven't necessarily been around, you know, for a short period of time. It's the massive scale of hyperscalers, of public cloud, the massive ability to move past data centers and then bring in all of that data and work against super fast processors. That's what changed. Well, you heard me talk about the data lake. It's kind of a natural join to say ML in a world of cloud where the architectures allow you to hook up. And I think it's going to make all of our lives better. And I think it's going to happen even faster than the cloud happened. So pay attention to this. It's, 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 uh, it's an exciting thing. So I'm going to close on, a, on an at scale example. And this is the Earth Observing System Data and Information System. It's a major core capability in NASA's Earth Science Data Systems Program. Think of just ingesting, processing, and archiving a lot of data from a lot of satellites. It's a lot of data that accumulates over time. And it has facilities all over the US and data centers. So hundreds of millions of data files coming in every year from hundreds of thousands of users. So that's all coming in. To give you a sense of the scale, from 2017 to 2020, 22, so the period of time we're in now, the ingest rate was projected to grow from under four petabytes to around 50 petabytes. And then you have to archive it. So we're talking massive scale. And their, uh, their office, the chief information officer, chose AWS for general purpose cloud services for NASA for that level of scale. And uh, you, know, you probably noticed that we constantly float down prices. We pass through any efficiencies and scale we get. That's so that um, all of you can feel comfortable putting your data on us, and uh, how's that for scale? And with that, um, I will take a few minutes for questions. Thanks very much, everyone.